Hi. Today on Measuring Up, we'll take a closer look at the inch. The inch itself is divided into several smaller units. To explain these units to you, let's look at four different rulers. This ruler is divided into half inches. This one into quarter inches. This one into eighths of an inch. And the last one is divided into sixteenths of an inch. Let's look at the first ruler marked in half inch sections or increments. Notice that every grouping of two half inch marks or increments equals one full inch. So that five of these is equivalent to two and a half inches. Now let's measure some line segments. Here is the first one. Notice that it's exactly four inches long or eight half inches. Now look at the second segment. Notice that it's longer than the first segment. In fact, it's more than five inches long. However, it does not end on one of the one half inch increments. That means we can't measure this segment with this ruler. Instead, we have to approximate the length of the segment. And to do that, we round the length of the segment to the nearest half inch. The length of the segment falls between five and five and a half inches, but it's closer to the five inch mark than the five and a half inch mark. So this segment is approximately five inches long, rounding it to the nearest half inch. For a more accurate measurement, we need a ruler marked into smaller units. This ruler is graduated or marked into quarter inch increments. See how this ruler compares to the half inch ruler? On this one, there are two quarter inch sections to every half inch. So, four quarter inch marks equals one full inch. Now let's measure the same segment as before. Again, it's easy to see, it doesn't fall exactly on a quarter inch marking. Instead, it's between five and five and a quarter inches. Since it's closer to the five and a quarter inch segment, we say that it is approximately five and a quarter inches long. The length is rounded to the nearest quarter inch. Again, we need a ruler that's divided into smaller units. Look at this one. It's divided into eighths of an inch. In other words, there are eight of these small units in one inch. Let's compare it to the other two rulers that we've seen already. Here they are. Notice that it takes two of these eighth markings to equal a quarter of an inch, four of them to equal a half inch, and eight eighths to equal a full inch. When I use this ruler to measure the second segment, you can see once more that the length of the segment lies between two of the eighth of an inch markings. Again, it's necessary to estimate the length rather than have an exact measure. This segment falls halfway between the eighth and two eighths mark. Since we always round up when the measure is half or greater, we can say that it is approximately five and two eighths inches which simplified is five and one quarter inches. Now we're ready to look at the final ruler which exhibits the smallest increments. Each increment is one sixteenth of an inch. Notice that it takes two sixteenths to equal an eighth of an inch, four sixteenths to equal a quarter of an inch, eight sixteenths to equal a half an inch, and 16 sixteenths to equal a full inch. Wow! When this ruler is placed on the same line segment, we can see that the segment is exactly five and three sixteenths of an inch long. Now we're ready to look at the standard ruler. You probably already own one. Hopefully, by learning to measure with it, we'll come to understand the various markings on it. Notice that it has markings of different sizes. The smallest markings are sixteenths of an inch, like these. The next smallest size marking represents one-eighth of an inch, like these. Next are the quarter inch segments, like these. And this marking, which sticks up the highest, 
represents half an inch. The markings over the numbers represent full inches. Having very small markings on a ruler allows you to measure small segments very precisely. And precise measurements can be really important in real world projects at home and work. Sometimes when we measure materials, we need to make our measurements as precisely as possible. For example, I'm cutting this board to a length of 10 and a quarter inches to match another one. Here we go. how accurately I did measure. Well, it looks like I measured correctly. They're exactly the same. Now that you understand the markings on the ruler and the need for precise measurement, there's something else I need to tell you about linear measurement. If I stand against the wall and begin to walk forward, I do not count the wall as the first step. The wall is considered zero. When you begin walking forward, that's when you begin counting. Step one, step two, step three. Hello, I'm down here. The same is true when using a ruler. Here I am at zero, but instead of starting here at zero, what if I slide over there towards the five and a half inch mark? Here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. If I start here at the five and a half inch mark, then this becomes my zero point. Now if I slide over three inches, with my starting position being here at five and a half inches, I'll end up at the eight and a half inch mark. One inch, two inches, and three inches. And here we are at eight and a half inches. So the zero point is where I began sliding. In this case, it was over there at the five and a half inch mark. In the real world of mathematics, it's often important to use precise measurements. But in that same world, we're sometimes required to round our measurements. That means giving an approximation, not an actual length. For instance, Good fellow. I say, I'm terribly lost. How far is it to the nearest service center? Well, speak, man. Well, as the crow flies, I'd say maybe five, six miles. Maybe. Six or seven, you say? Give or take. Well, it looks way farther than that, and I'm frightfully low on petrol. But if your estimate is correct, I can make it. Are you sure it's six or seven? Oh, six, seven mile. Give or take a mile here or there. Hmm. How do I know I can trust your estimate? How do I know you know anything? I know one thing. And what might that be? 
I know I ain't lost. Earlier, while we were measuring the line segment, we had to use measurements that were approximations because of the markings on some of the rulers weren't small enough. Many times in math, we're asked to round measurements to the nearest inch, half inch, quarter inch, or to the nearest eighth of an inch. When we travel, we depend on road signs to tell us how far it is to our destination. That way, we can better plan our travel time. In our daily travels, it helps a lot to know how far we'll have to travel to get from one place to another. Mark rides his bike to the library and back from the library every day. Every day like clockwork, he leaves his house for the library. Rain or shine, he travels that same route. Nothing can stop him. Back and forth, back and forth. From home to the library. From the library back home again. Traveling that same two and a half miles from one to the other every day. In truth, Happiness for Mark is kicking back and relaxing with a good book. The question then is this. How many miles does Mark ride in a week going back and forth from home to the library? To help us solve this problem, let's look at a map that shows the location of Mark's house in relation to the library. Here's Mark's home, and here's the library, two and a half miles away. Remember, Every day, he rides to the library and returns home. This means Mark travels two and a half miles each way, or a total of five miles every day. Since he does this once a day, seven days a week, multiply seven times five. The product is 35. So, Mark travels a total of 35 miles between home and the library every week. So, Inches, feet, yards, miles. Today we've seen how they all figure into our daily lives. We've even learned a song to help us remember these linear lengths of measurement. Next time, we'll explore liquid measure and how important it is in our daily lives. Until then, Miles McLeader here. Bye for now.